please share your first and last name. First name Zubeda. Last name is Abdul Hakim. Okay, great. Your gender? Female. What is your um, race and ethnicity? Um, African American, and um, ethnicity. Uh, yeah, I feel like African American covers all of that, right? It does. Yeah. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and your religion? I'm Muslim American. Yes. How old are you? I will be 39 next month. <laughs> oh wow! Happy early birthday! <laughs> Thank you. Do you have any disabilities? None. What is your highest level of education? My highest level of education, I would say third year college. Yeah. Where are you currently living? Right now, I live in New Jersey. I'm in Piscataway, New Jersey, which is central Jersey. Um, and I'm originally from Brooklyn, New York. Okay. I, I'm from New York also. Grew up in yeah. South Island and also in Jersey now, in Jersey City. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where else have you lived? Um, that's it. Brooklyn and Jersey. Okay. Born and raised. Same here. <laughs> How would you describe your sexuality? Um, um, I, straight, heterosexual. I guess that's what we call it nowadays. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. That that works. Are you in a romantic relationship? Yes, I'm married, and I've been married for eighteen years. Nineteen this year. Wow. Yeah. And can you describe your professional background? Um, so professionally, I have a degree in accounting. Um, so I have that background. And then I also have, um, I've studied and I've done pattern making. So I have a mix of the two, which I feel are like the perfect combination to start your own business. And can you describe your personal clothing style and if or how it reflects your Muslim identity? Okay, so my personal clothing style, I like... Um, more relaxed fits. I like things that I can do multi use with. Um, because I'm a mom of four boys, I I have you know my mom things that I wear. I have my work things as well as you know things that I do date night stuff like that. But I feel like my clothes they kind of have to be a chameleon, right? And they have to fit into all aspects of life. Um. But they all go back to my Islamic identity, which is modest, right? Which is covering. Um, so yeah, I hope I answered that. Where it's, I'm more, I don't know. I feel like they're more bohemian type, more casual things that I could either dress up or dress down. Explain an outfit that you might wear. Okay. Um, so like, let's say it's a mom thing. We've been to Disney. I like to wear more tunic tops where they'll come to my knee and then I'll wear wide pants or, you know, a slimmer pants. So it balances out. So if I'm wearing something more voluminous up top, then the legs are going to be slimmer. Um, and that's, that's really like my day to day. If I'm grocery shopping or doing anything family, um, aspect. If it's something that's for work, I'll wear more dresses. I'll wear longer dresses or I'll wear midi length dresses um, and sneakers because I'm running around. If I'm at a photo shoot, if I'm, you know, um, selling, if I'm vending, um, I like to wear things that I can move around in. and definitely everything has to have a pocket. So that's like <laughs> my, you know, my day-to-day -day outfits. Thank you. How do you feel when you're wearing clothing that reflects your Muslim identity? Um, honestly, I feel humbled because not everyone, um, not, it's not in everyone's heart to, you know, dress modestly or to cover their hair. Um, so I feel like I've been chosen, you know, to dress modestly because you do have Muslim women you know, they still identify as Muslim women, but they may not dress as modest as some women may. And that's everyone's personal choice. And I feel like, you know, it has to be placed in your heart. So I'm humbled that I've been chosen, you know, to dress modestly. And what was your experience when shopping or wearing products that you offer before starting Styled by Zubeda? Um, so before starting Style by Zubeda, it was extremely difficult. I started Style by Zubeda in 2012, where we were really like at the beginning, very beginning stages of the huge, modest, you know, dressing boom, um, where 
if you wanted to wear something modest, you would have to get a maxi dress and then layer it with sweaters, long sleeve shirts. So if I found anything that was modest, I would have to then, you know, add layers to it. But then on top of it, I'm curvy size. So my brand is really for plus size, modest Muslim women where it was absolutely like impossible to get anything. You know, if you're walking into a big box store, if you're walking into, you know, like solicit plus size, if you're working at Ashley Stewart or Lane Bryant, there was nothing for us. So we would have to really like get things custom made. So nowadays, you know, with the boom in the modest fashion, you know, it's a little bit easier, but 10 years ago, it was impossible, you know? So I, I really didn't shop anywhere. I would have to sew or get someone to make something or piece outfits together. Yeah. And I noticed that was very unique to your business model, how you yeah. cater to the plus size fashion industry. So. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You said you started in 2012. Mm -hmm. um, so how and when did you think about launching um, Stop by Zubeda? Sure. So back in 2012, um, I actually started with jewelry. There was... Um, there was like a beaded bracelet that had a cross on it back in 2012, like beaded bracelets were like the huge thing back then. Um, so I actually manufactured and designed a piece that said a law in Arabic. Um, and when I started the bracelets, like they kind of like, you know, just started growing from there. And then I say, you know what, the money that I make from this, let me put it into the dresses because this is what I really, you know, wanted to do. Um, so with the dresses, you know, I had a friend that I would style her, you know, for, you know, different things. And I would go into the stores and she would suggest, Hey, let's go to the plus size department. And then I will bump into the same issue where, you know, there wasn't really anything, um, for me. Um, so that's kind of how, like I started with the, um, the dresses. I knew that for me personally, I wanted clothing that fit me well, that fit my Muslim identity. Like I said earlier, you know, I could get things and add them together, but there wasn't a full, it wasn't a place that me as a plus size modest woman can go to. Then we had brands that started, um, there was one brand, Abaya Attic. So Abaya Attic was like the first brand in the U.S. that catered to Muslim women um, that I knew of, and they were based out of Chicago. And we would purchase things from the sister to wear for Eid, Ramadan, which is um, Eid is our holiday and um, our religious holiday after you fast the month of Ramadan. So we would, you know, my friends, they would buy things from her brand, but the largest size went up to an extra large. Mm -hmm. Me, I was an extra large, but their extra large was more European extra large, right? I'm an African-American woman. Like we're curvy all over, you know? So my extra large and their extra large wasn't on the same spectrum. It was more of a medium on me. And that's one of um, the biggest problems in the fashion industry right now is yeah. the lack of a standardized worldwide sizing. And yes, yes, economy. yes. Yeah. So um, then I say, you know what, the money that I'm making from the bracelets, I'm going to actually, you know, with my background in pattern making, I'm going to make a pattern and I'm going to just test it out. I'm going to just, you know, test the waters, make one dress, you know. So um, it kind of launched from there. It was it was always a struggle for me when it was our holiday because I did want it something that wasn't from Old Navy that I had to throw <laughs> on over or from target because it seems like those were really the only stores that catered to more of the curvier size because at the time h&m zara those places they really didn't have modest you know clothing now saying that it sounds a little crazy because now that's all they do right you walk into zara and everything looks like it's made for modest people but back then there wasn't anything yeah, even so, Shein is on the bandwagon. Yes, even Shein. So it's like, wow, you know. So now, Muslim women that have these companies, we have major, major competition where you could go to Shein and have, you know, a ten dollar dress, you know, and it's, you know, long sleeve, long dresses lined, and it's like, you know, people are kind of like, you know, running in that direction. But 
I felt like, you know, 10 years ago, well, 11 years ago now, it was really, you know, important for women like myself that could afford nice clothing, you know, but they were curvier and then it, they didn't want to get anything custom made all the time um, to be able to go to a place where um, your size matters. You know, it's standard. An extra large is an extra large. And, you know, there's no confusion. I think it's in the name, but what is the significance of the name of your company? Okay, so with Style by Zubeda, it's more of a curated style. It's things that I personally like. It's things that I know women um, that live lifestyles like myself, they would, you know, enjoy these pieces. It's more of my personal style where I don't um, design according to what's in fashion, um, like you'll have your Pantone colors of the year or this style is what's in for this year. I know me as a curvy person, not everything is going to work for my body type, not every color, not every print. So I do style everything and pick everything, you know, really, um, because of that, um, I, I'm more, um, stomach, like I'm wider in my stomach area. So I know as a plus size person that may, that may be their, you know, issue. Every woman has one place on their body that they're like, oh, it's my arms. Oh, it's my thighs. So I make sure that whatever I design, I keep all of those body types in mind. And I say, hey, if someone is larger in the stomach, they're not going to want giant polka dots on their stomach, right? So I keep that in mind. And I feel like that's why the curvy size and the plus size women, you know, they, um, nav they gravitate towards my brand is because I know what looks good on a curvy size body versus what wouldn't. Um, so yeah, even the hijabs and the jewelry, everything is kind of like styled by myself. And originally I did start out um, my brand by styling people for like holidays or for red carpets or for shows like that. So I, you know, that's kind of how I started. Tell me about the business model for Styled by Zubeda. Okay, so the business model right now, we're more of a hybrid where we do sell in person and we sell online. Um, in person, well, we had a store, we closed it last year. It was in Newark, New Jersey. Um, but then as well, we do a lot of trade shows and I like to meet my customers in person. I like my customers to touch, feel the product, to try on the product because I feel like everyone is programmed with the European size chart. When they hear 1X, they think it's like ginormous, right? Because they're thinking 1X is really like a large. So I do like, you know, my customers to try on things, to say, wait, it's a 1X, but it really does fit me. You know, it's not like huge where I feel um, like an extra large. If you go to other places, like a Zara, an extra large is like a medium, you know, which I feel like their size <laughs> guide is extremely small, you know. Um, so I feel like it's really important to meet the customer, but also we do much better selling online. So that was one of the reasons why we closed the store in Newark, um, because the online sales are much better. So for 2023, we're going to be doing more trade shows and more pop-ups, but not really like a, um, a brick and mortar any longer. Pop-ups are um, uh, extremely helpful also in yeah. testing markets and just yeah. reaching new target markets. Yeah. Um, I'm actually teaching a retailing and service design course this semester, and the right. project for my students will be to um, design a pop-up for brands of their choice. Nice. Something nice. the brand has not done yet. Yes, yes. There are some locations that you've done pop-ups. Sure. So um usually we do a big one, big one. It's called ICNA. And ICNA is always in Baltimore. So we do that. Um, we've been to Chicago. Um, and we do a lot around the city, around Manhattan. So yeah, the the furthest we've been, and we've been to Atlanta. So we kind of like, yeah, we travel. Um we haven't been to the West Coast yet, but I mean, Chicago is heading in that direction. But um, that's true. Yeah. 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 I mean, and I think, um, you know, there's so many opportunities now where Miami had the first Modest Fashion Week. Yes. Or, yes. Um, you know, for the Muslim Modest Fashion community. Yes. yes. It was yes. Um, a Modest Fashion exhibit. 
in uh, San Francisco a couple of years back. Yes, yes, you yes. Know, eventually, yes. I'd like to do, if I continue working on this research, I'd like to do an exhibit um, in the New York metro area. Nice, nice. Because I know they had one a few years ago. Um, I don't know if it was MoMA they had it at, um, but they had one for modest fashion. And then Miami, I was actually um, scheduled to go to the one that they had for December, but they had to reschedule that one. Um, but yeah, and that was a fashion show. And before that, they had a few, it was called Hijab Fest. It was in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Okay. Um, and I, I've i done a ton of shows. So the one, the Hijab Fest was really like the biggest one that they had, but because of COVID, they stopped doing it. And, uh, you know, I don't know if they're going to pick it back up, but um, yeah, I've, yeah, we've traveled a Amazing. little over the past 10 years. Yeah. And you said you design your own products. So yes. do you yes. also, do you buy any products wholesale or? So as far as hijabs, um, I, not that I wholesale, well, I do wholesale, but I choose the colors. Like I don't go into a catalog and say, okay, give me this, this, that. So everything that I have, like, let's say, for instance, this hijab is a printed hijab. This is something that I drew out and I said, I like this print. I like the fabric. Okay, let's test it out and see what it looks like. For the hijabs, if I have something that's a solid color, I'll try to match it up to, you know, I'll try to match the um the dye up to one of the dresses. So, you know, it's, it's going to be a standard cotton or a standard jersey. But the, I'll make sure that the dye is something that's unique to, to style by Zubeda. As far as the dresses, so all of the dresses, I actually sketch them. I actually, um, I'll send my sketches over um, to my my team in Korea. I do have, you know, manufacturing over in Korea, Korea and China. Um, so I do that. And between me sketching they'll also um, fabric source where they'll go to their um, fabric market and we'll shop together. Like I'll do a Zoom call with them or FaceTime with them and I'll, they'll walk through the fabric market and I'll, you know, just like how we're talking, they'll say, hey, do you like this print, this one, this one, you know? Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm like up all night, you know, with them and we're, you know, I'm working with them in Korea and China. So I'm like, in China every day. Um, <laughs> so celebrating Lunar yeah, New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. They're off. Yeah. So they'll be back in February. So they take off the whole month of January. So if anything that I'm working on for spring, I usually do that like towards November, December to get that ready because they're then they're strict with it. You know, like they'll shut down everything for a whole month. Um but yeah, as far as some of the dresses, a lot of times, if I'm not sketching things, if I see something, let's just say Zara again, right? If I see something in Zara and I'm like, I love this, but I feel like if we added a sleeve or we made it longer, or we changed this and added that, it would fit a modest body, you know, a little bit better. So I do get a little bit of inspiration off of other designs that I've seen, other, you know, brands, even more high-end things, you know, I'm like, oh, how can we make something like this? you know, for the modest body type, but a little bit more affordable, right? Because you'll see something from Gucci and you're like, oh my gosh, I just love this dress. You know, it's $5,000 and it doesn't have a sleeve, but if we added a sleeve, it would, you know, it would work for us, you know? So I do tend to get inspiration off of other brands, but then I have my core pieces and my core things, you know, that, you know, my customers, they just love, so. Great. And can you tell me a little bit about the type of products you offer and uh, your price point? Sure, sure. So we offer hijabs. We offer um, two-piece sets like skirts and tops. We also offer um, palazzo pants, um, tunics. We offer blouses. Like our skirts and tops are blouses and skirts. And then we offer a ton of dresses. So the dresses, they, they range. So when I started, um, style by Zubeda, I was actually pregnant. So all of our dresses, for the most part, I would say 90% of our dresses, they are all nursing friendly. So even like the dress I have on, it has a zipper, everything that I make, I make sure, especially the 
more essential pieces where they're solid. You can wear them day to day. They will have a zipper because if you're a mom, you're a new mom and you wear me a day to day stuff, you need to be able to nurse regardless of how cute your outfit is. Those babies, they do not care. Um, I love that. So I made, and they all, all of my dresses have pockets. So that's one thing. Like you can be wearing our most expensive dress, which is, I believe it's 150. So we range. So we go between 80 to 150 in our dresses. So they're, you know, really affordable. Um, so every dress has pockets because me as a mom of four boys, right? I'm always carrying gum or somebody's ball or something and it has to go in my pockets. Um, even though I wouldn't be caught dead without a pocketbook, you know, but <laughs> I like to, you know, get to my pockets just in case I don't want to dig in my bag, you know? So yeah. I, and then with our hijabs, we have, um, hijabs they start at 10 and then our most expensive is going to be like 30 dollars. so we try to stay i would say mid-range we're not as cheap as a shein you know but all of our products are you know top quality products um with the best fabrics and they're all hand selected by myself i'm not you know going on aliexpress and saying give me five give me ten um which is why I feel like my brand is so sustainable is because it's not something that you can just order online. You can just order, like there's a lot of modest brands out here, like all of the girls are selling the same things. Um, and that's because they're all going online. You know, they're all buying, this, purchasing the same thing, you know, and of course they're, you know, they have influencers and they're taking pictures and it makes it look, you know, great. But at the end of the day, it's all the same skirt. It's all, you know, same, same thing. Yeah. And do you envision expanding your offerings? So right now, the only thing I would see myself expanding, maybe I'm really into home decor. Um, I would love to maybe design something that maybe a vase or a rug or some pillows, something that would, you know, um, fit into that type of lifestyle. Um as right now, I do want to add a bridal side to the dresses um, because I do get a lot of um, requests from sisters and they're asking for more fancier clothes, more things that they can wear to weddings, things that, you know, maybe they're not necessarily the bride, maybe they're the, the mother of the bride or the mother of the groom or they want to wear something to their like engagement or henna party. So I do get a lot of um, requests for that. So that's something that we're actually working on. Um, we're working on that side. Of Very it. exciting. And I know you already shared a little bit about me, about what you do, but in addition to, you know, um, in addition to finding and sourcing the materials and working with your suppliers overseas, what would a day like, uh, a day in a life of Zubeda look like? Okay. So a day in the life of Zubeda is crazy. Um, if, if it's out, so I'll not mention like home stuff, right? So let's say I'm going to do a shoot because, okay. So yesterday, yesterday I did a content shoot, um, where I, I don't know if you've heard of peer space before. Um, so peer space is, it's a, it's an app where, content creators, they can go and they can book like um, spaces where they have it decorated and uh, you take pictures in front of all of like the setups, right? It's kind of like content creation space. So I did that yesterday. And what I did was I recorded a lot of the things that I post on social media for like my reels or if I have a new product. So that's big. Content creation for your brand through social media is how I make 80% of my money. Um, and I advertise through Instagram and Facebook, but the content creation, like you could just be doing a reel and you're talking that automatically you're make a sale. So that's something that I have to do. <laughs> I have to consciously do once a week, but then once a month I leave from, you know, my home office and I go to a space and I create, you know, a content. I sit down for three hours and I just create that. Um, if it's a day where, you know, I'm doing a photo shoot where it's other models. So I do speak with my team and we map out, um, what we need to sell, what's new, what's coming up. 
Um, so Mondays I speak with my team and we have like a two hour meeting and we say, okay, what happened last month? What did we sell? What didn't we sell? What's coming up? So right now, what's big for us is Ramadan is coming up in March. So Ramadan is when Muslims, they fast for 30 days. So that's coming up. Now, even though we're all hungry, it's like the biggest thing for us. Everyone, you know, we have iftars, which I'm not, I don't, I'm not sure if you're familiar, but it's the breaking of the fast when the sun sets. So traditionally people go to how, you know, your family's house, um, especially on Fridays. So we know the women, they shop a lot during Ramadan because you're always going somewhere. You want to have on a new outfit, new this, you want to gift people with things. So we always work on our strategy. Okay. What are the new gift sets that we're going to be selling? How are we going to promote these things? How are we going to tell people that they need these things? So we have a big brainstorming meeting every Monday and um, we discuss, okay, what's coming up? What can we do? What can we change? Um, what can I, what kind of content can I create? What kind of influences do we re reach out to? And it's a lot of kicking and screaming, you know, cause it's all women. So we all have, you know, our opinions about, what we think will work, what won't work. And I'm always, you know, I'm I'm more open to hearing their ideas because I feel like as a CEO of a company, you can't think you know everything, right? It's very important, especially from the youth to get their input and get what, you know, they're seeing because a lot of the times they see things before we see things, you know, and I'm not that old, but I still feel like, you know, people that are younger than me, I'm always open to learning from them. Um. Yeah, so I, every day I try to like do something specific um, towards a goal. Oh, that's great. I mean, I learn yeah. from my students every day too. You know, it's yeah. it's a it's a a shared learning environment. Yes, 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 definitely. We're only good. At, we're only as good as our teams. Exactly. I think you kind of touched on some of this about the design and product development process. How you go from concept to final product, you know, I you kind of source and draw inspiration um, from a few yeah. different retailers, brands, your own style as well. Right? Yes, yes. And um, so mainly it's all basically designed in-house and then um, you have uh, you source your materials overseas, work with yes. suppliers to manufacture in China and Korea, right? Yes, yes, yes. Definitely. Okay. Do you have any um, garments or products to share? So this dress right here is called our Lynn dress, which is named after my mother. Her name is Evangeline, right? <laughs> and um, this one right here, this was my first dress that I designed. So when I designed it originally, it was, I believe it was black. It was a black dress black printed dress. So all of our Lynn dresses, they're all floral prints and they all have buttons at in the front, right? So they all have these buttons, which was because I was nursing and I wanted to make sure that I, you know, was able to breastfeed. Now- Looking fab and nursing too. <laughs> yes, right? So I wanted to make sure of that. Now, the second thing with this dress is that because- I carried my weight in my stomach area. And because I was pregnant and not pregnant, back and forth, back and forth, I knew that in the stomach area, I didn't want any elastic here. But if you don't have any type of elastic in the waist area, then it's going to be shapeless. So what I did was I just added elastic on both sides of the hips nice. so that it does give shape, but it doesn't bulk you in the stomach area, right? And of course, this dress has pockets as well. So I wanted to make sure, you know, that I kept those things in mind. And then as well, it has it has buttons on the sleeve. So um, when we make wudu, which is cleansing ourselves before we pray, um, you can roll your sleeve up because when you make wudu, you have to get to your arms. So those, especially the button aspect of it, that's part of something that is, you know, with our Muslim identity, you can get a dress that has the sleeves, but if you can't roll your sleeves up, you, you know, you can't participate in prayer because you, you know, you didn't cleanse yourself. Even like the dress that I have on now, it has the elastic so I can actually roll my, you know, my sleeve up. Um, 
And that's something that if you were to purchase from a brand that's not owned by a Muslim, they're not going to think about all of those things. You know, um, they're going to think about the fashion. They're going to think about, OK, how do we get them in long sleeve dresses and long dresses? But they don't know okay. the mind of a Muslim, you know, so that's something that all of my dresses and I also have another dress, which I don't have it down here. The sleeves is made from a fabric that is a little bit fitted, but I have an invisible zipper so that you zip it and you can still get to your arms. And that's something that, you know, kudos to the big brands that's attempting to sell to the Muslim woman, but they don't understand us because they're not us. That's, that's the whole thing. You know, there was a dress. Um, it was a Gucci dress and it had these ruffles on the sleeves, but it was like well, ruffles on the shoulders, but it was a short sleeve dress. So I went out and I kind of created something a little similar, but I exaggerated the ruffle on the sleeve. I did make it a longer sleeve and it's like three tiered, similar to the Gucci dress. And it's made out of this pink um, silk fabric. I feel like the print is so me. Like it's bold. Not all, you know, curvy size, plus size Muslim women may gravitate towards this. But I do feel like, you know, it gives an extra layer of luxury. Um, and this pink tone, it is the color of the year um, where everyone's into magentas and pinks and, you know, bright reds. And this is something that I just absolutely love this print. It's a small enough print that on top of a plus size body, it's not going to be overwhelming, but it is something that's fun, right? So a lot of my things are fun, are colorful, are daring. And I want the Muslim woman to not be afraid to, you know, wear the colors, you know, um, because too often you see brands, Muslim owned brands that they just specialize in blacks, browns, grays, sage. And I'm like, why not be colorful? You know? So I feel like they're still trying to play it safe in certain ways. Um, and my women, the ones that, you know, the, the, the customers that do shop, <clears throat> they're not afraid to wear colors. They come to me because I designed something that's different from a basic black abaya, basic brown abaya. They can actually show off their curves and be, you know, proud of that. And that's something that we really like look into is a lot of body positivity um, because we have a lot of things going for us. You're already plus size. You're already a Muslim woman. They already think like, oh, you're big. You should be wearing this color or this shape, you know? So I'm like anti everything, you know? So yeah, those are two of my um, my core products that we sell the most of. Wow. Okay. Thank you. And do you have examples of um, uh, maybe some abayas or hijabs that... So I'll show you a hijab because I don't sell a bias at all. This is our jersey, which is our best-selling hijab. And it's actually called the XL jersey, right? Because everything here is bigger and better, right? So this is our jersey and it's actually 72 inches wide. And we make it this big for, certain, for a number of reasons. One of the reasons we like to make it extra because if you're nursing, you can just cover yourself with this, right? If you're a nursing mom, then a lot of our customers, they'll have either locks or sister locks. So if you're wearing a hijab that's shorter in the back, then your hair is going to show. So a lot of our customers actually like they, we have some, and we have these in 30 different colors. And then we have some people that purchase every single color. We're the only brand on the modest market that sells the hijabs these this big. Um, and this is it doubled, you know. So we're the only one that sells it this wide and this long. Because I'm thinking of my customers. Like myself, I don't have locks, but I do have long hair. And if I blow dry it, it's going to like hang out, you know, the back of my hijab unless I'm wearing a jersey. And yeah, this is our most, most popular um, hijab. And it comes in bright colors. Like we sell black as well, but our brighter colors sell better than the darker colors, which is, 
you know, you think a black hijab or brown is, you know, safe and everyone needs one of those. But yeah, this is our flame orange and this is our best selling color, um, which is crazy to me. Well, it makes and, sense because that's what distinguishes you from the other modern yeah, brands. Yeah. Yeah, because they can go somewhere else and buy a born color. They probably and, have a ton or it, you know. yes, yes. Yeah, so that's our, you know, signature one. And then we do have prints. Like the one that I'm wearing now is one of our prints. And it's extra big as well. Um, but yeah, the jerseys, yeah, thank you so much. And the jerseys are all like, yeah, that's, yeah. When the sisters see me, especially as women, we tend to spend more when we're in store. When, when I'm doing a pop-up or I'm selling somewhere, they'll buy like every color. Online, they'll buy two to be safe, and then they'll come back again, spend more money on shipping. And you don't buy anything wholesale? No, I don't buy anything wholesale. Everything is custom. Tell me about your customers. Um, So I feel like my customers are, like, I have a very niche customer base, right? They're going to be curvy size, plus size, um, American Muslim women. I would say 80, I would say 75% of my customers are going to be African-American women. Um, and then the other 25 would be mixed between, you know, Arab women and other Muslim um, customers. But then I also, I do have some um, customers that are not Muslim women, but they are modest dressers. Um, when we had our store in Newark, we were right across the street from a church. So I did have a lot of women that would come from church and they would, you know, say, hey, I have a black and white party to go to next week. Do you have anything? And they would like, you know, buy the things and wear with the church hats and everything. Um, and then last fashion week, so September, I went to um, a fashion show that was hosted by Toby Rubenstein and um she's a, a Jewish woman and she wrote a book about fashion. So while I was there, there were tons of Jewish women that were there, as well as um Muslim women, because it was um an interfaith fashion show where they had Jewish women and Muslim women. And that's where I met um the sister that runs Miami Modest Fashion Week. So she had looks going down the runway. And then from there, I kind of gained like a ton of Jewish um customers. So it's, I would still say a 75% Muslim women and 25% other. And even online, are you noticing um mainly sales in the US or abroad? No, I've I um I have a lot of Canada sales. Okay. Yeah. I, I would say a, a good bulk for the year, I would mm, about 10%. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good number. I think the modest fashion um, industry is well developed in the Eastern world. Yes, yes, they they're ahead of us. I feel like. Um, so I do get a good number. I feel the more ads that I post, the more I get the customers over there. Um, yeah, Canada, and then I had a few in UK. I do a few in the Caribbean. So it's all over the place, yeah, okay. but mainly in the U.S. So yeah. um, so how do your customers find out about your brand and how do they purchase? Okay, so the, the people that's in the U.S., whenever I do any events, whenever I vend or pop up, that's where we get the bulk of our new customers in that area. Okay, that um, When we did ISNA, so this was Chicago. This is about five years ago. We went to Chicago for the first time and it was just to test it out. And I didn't have a lot of product. I went with a few dresses on hand and I came home with nothing. Like we sold literally everything. And then driving home, because we did drive and it was a 14 hour drive. Mm -hmm. My Shopify app on my phone was like blowing up. Like they were purchasing everything that was online from the event. So if I sold out, I would tell people, hey, you can always buy online. And a lot of the times when you do pop-ups, and you tell people to shop online, they normally don't shop online. Like they're like, oh, okay, I'll think about it. But literally driving home, it was, just, I had hundreds of orders. And then I gained a whole new community in Chicago, a whole new, you know, 
um, following Instagram, Facebook, everything kind of like blew up in Chicago. And I was like, wow, these pop-ups, they really do work, you know? So the class you're going to teach, that's like a good class because you really do gain your customer wherever you go. And then, you know, word of mouth, then they spread, you know, the news that way. Um, so between pop-ups and, you know, trying to at least get four or five in a year um, and in different cities that maybe you've never been to, or maybe you have a small clientele in that area. Because when I did Atlanta, I had a few orders from Atlanta and I said, let me test this out and go down there, you know, and do a pop-up with other vendors and other brands and see what happens. Then I gained it even like, I feel like my customer base is more in Atlanta than it is in New York, New Jersey. Um, because there's a huge Black Muslim community in Atlanta. You know, it was a Black community in Atlanta anyway, but then, you know, you add in the Muslim aspect and they still have the same issue that I had, which is you can't necessarily find something in your size that's ready to wear. So that's why they really like gravitate towards, you know, style by Zubeda. Um so yeah, other than like doing pop-ups, we do advertisement. So at one point I was doing Google ads. I don't necessarily like Google ads because they charge you even if no one clicks on it. Um, So they, you know, and they charge a hefty amount. I think I had a 30 day ad and it was about $500. Okay. And now that they're <clears throat> phasing out third party cookies, you're not able to collect consumer data. Yes. So yes. it's almost beneficial to connect with consumers directly. Yeah. Yes. So I do at least one or two Facebook slash Instagram ads a month. Um, but then during like slow season, I kind of turn it off. But I feel like when I do have an ad running, we do extremely well. And I try to change up the audience every now and again, even though um, Facebook tells you, hey, we'll pick audience for you. Sometimes I want to get outside of that parameter and maybe see if I can reach someone that's necessarily, that's not necessarily have the same interests as us, same followers as us, just to test it out. Um, and I, and I think it does fairly well where sometimes I'll catch non-Muslim women. And that's what I want to do. I want it to be modest clothing, not necessarily Muslim only clothing, um, and I think that's really important because you have a lot of women, you know, that dress modestly. They may not wear hijab. They may not be Muslim, you know, and they want to wear longer dresses. So I feel like, yeah, the the um, social media ads are extremely important for my business. And that's how I make 80 percent of my money. And how much interaction do you have with your customers and who from uh, Style by Zubeda is interacting with them? Or So I have a mix. So it's Amina. <clears throat> She's really like my assistant. She answers my emails. She lets me know like, okay, you need to do this, this, that. Um, and then I also have a social media manager. Her name is Halima. <clears throat> and she does a lot of the DM, um, a lot of the correspondent through the DM. But then I do it also um, because everything is on my phone. So if she's not available, then I do it. Like even we have a um <clears throat> on our website, we have a pop-up that says chat with us where we give styling advice. So if you go to the website and you're like, hey, I like this pink dress, can you please tell me what hijabs works well with this or what matches, you know, back to it? So let's even say they're looking at this dress. I can say, hey, the orange may go, but it may not be exactly. You know, so that's me. That's really me between me and Amina. So I like to interact with them. I do a lot of Instagram lives where I'll do an outfit of the day. So I'll go on and I'll tell people, hey, this is my outfit of the day. Um, and I'll tell them exactly what the hijab is. And then I'll tell them what other hijabs we have online that will match back to this dress. And, you know, and we'll talk like we and I do that once a week um, with the customers and then also once a week or well, every two weeks, we do a live, we bring on a guest and we discuss body positivity and how they achieve body positivity um, with being a curvy size Muslim woman. Um, one of my notable guests, she's a bodybuilder and she's a Muslim. So she was telling people, you know, how she was, you know, um, diagnosed with diabetes and obesity. And then she started, you know, bodybuilding and lifting and all of that. 
although she's still curvy, you know, she's outside, you know, she's, she's not diabetic anymore. And, you know, with losing weight, she's not obese any longer. So I feel like it's really important to have an open dialogue with your customer, an open dialogue with your followers, especially on social media. Um, and they may not necessarily be customers, you know, all of your followers, because I believe we have 12,000. They may not necessarily be your customer. They may not be able to afford it. They may not, but they still want to be a part of a community, you know, which is Muslim women, African-American Muslim women, you know, that have the similar struggles with maybe their weight, with the clothing. And yeah, I like to keep an open dialogue with them. That's amazing to build yeah. such a wonderful community. I know Thank one you. of um, when I was uh, um, um, researching um, uh, just cultural identity in general, mm -hmm. um, there was a Muslim bodybuilder who was not able to participate in a national or international competition because yes. her clothing requirements did not um, meet the requirement. Her, yes. her, her clothing did not meet the requirements. Yes. Of the Yes, yes, because there's a similar sister. Her name is Belle Keys, and she yes. was um, going to be in a WNBA, and she Hold couldn't. Yes, yes. So she's a part of the Style by Zabeda community. So, Amazing. yes, so we chat all the time. She DMs. We talk to each other. So she's not curvy size. She's not a plus size woman, but she's still within the African-American community that has struggled with covering and you know it inhibited her from you know making a living for her family now she you know she can't play right now you know so it's very important to have that sisterhood you know in that community it is that's wonderful and what type of shopping experiences do you want your customers to have so i want my customers to be able to come in my shop and to feel safe and and not judged you have some brands that they'll sell black, they'll sell brown, um, they'll sell more um, conservative, um, modest clothing, right? So I like to say that I'm more of a liberal, um, modest dresser, and my brand is more of a liberal brand. So I feel like women that may be transitioning from not wearing hijab to wearing hijab, they'll go to places and they'll feel judged, right? Um, Because you have women on all levels. Like I'm a hijab wearer today, but that doesn't mean tomorrow I may not be. And then the day that I decide to come back and I walk into your shop, I don't want to feel judged like, oh, oh, now you want to cover now? Or, oh, now, you know, so why didn't you? I'm not, you know, I don't really do that. And when I had to shop in Newark, New Jersey, I would say a lot of the people that walked in, they were women that they didn't cover. They were women that maybe their boyfriends were Muslim. And they're like, I need to cover because he wants me to meet the family. And I, I'm from Brooklyn. Like I've seen a lot of things, you know, and people in my family, like my sister, she doesn't cover. We're born Muslim, you know, so everyone's on their own level. And I feel with a lot of Muslims, we tend to be judgmental of how people dress. And that's something that with my brand, I don't like to do. Even as far as the clothes, even for the covering women, I've been to masjids. I've been to place of worships where if I'm wearing purple or pink they or red, they'll look at me and I'm like, well, where's this sister from? You know, where is she coming from? You know, that's not modest, the color that she's wearing, you know? And I like to believe that everyone has their own definition of modesty. And I'm not the judge of what you claim is modesty versus what I claim is modest, you know? So I, I know a lot of Muslims, they have that problem where they'll say, hey, your neck is showing. That's not modest. But to you, you're like, my my chest is covered, right? My hair is pulled back. To me, that's modest. If that's your definition of modesty, then that's your definition. And as Muslims, we're, we're really nitpicky with that. So that's, I love that my customers can come to me and they know it's a judgment free. Like if you want to purchase a dress, I'm here to sell you a dress. I'm not here to teach you what modesty should be. 
what are you most proud of in your brand so far? Um, what am I most proud of? I am most proud of that. I have that longevity. Um, it's difficult, you know, um, being such a small business, right? It's difficult financing yourself. It's difficult, you know, digging in your own pocket and doing the payroll. It's difficult coming out with a new, um, line every year. Um, especially during the pandemic, I feel like, um, some ways it was difficult, but then some ways I was extremely proud of myself. I opened my store in, you know, Newark, New Jersey during the pandemic. So we opened in, wow, 2020. I forget the year, like we're in 23. I signed my lease in 2019, but we're in um, um quarantine. So I really couldn't open until, you know, later on that year. Um, So that was one of my proudest moments that I really pushed through and say, you know what? I'm going to work on this store. I'm going to get the store together. Um, and I'm going to really like have a safe place for Muslim women that they can come and shop and everything. Opening the store was one of my proudest moments because it kind of allowed me to like make a home for myself <laughs> where, cause I do a lot of pop-ups and doing pop-ups. It's a lot a lot of work. It's a lot of work because you have to pack up everything. You have to tag everything, inventory, everything, get your team. And you have to, you know, I feel like one of the most difficult tasks with pop-ups, um, especially when I do them, I do them in huge conventions. Your booth has to stand out from someone else's booth. So like you said, designing a booth, that is very, I'm still struggling with that. You know, um, because every year it has to look, you know, different. You have to do something different. It has to be some wow factor that makes, you know, someone want to visit your booth. Um, so to me, I was getting a little tired of that. Like, I felt like, you know, I'm getting older. I'm like, this is a lot. I have four kids. It's a lot on us to do that every year. Um, so opening the store, it kind of eliminated that. But then it was a lesson to be learned where... I got the clientele in Newark, but it wasn't as big as it is with the pop-up. So that's just something that I'ma just have to, I'm gonna have to work around and you know, <laughs> figure out what I'm gonna do. So yeah. And what has been most successful for your brand? I know um one thing you have mentioned was um Instagram marketing. Yeah, yeah. So the yeah, the thing that's most successful, um I did my own pop-up instead of, um, you know, going to other brands, pop-ups or, you know, conventions. When I did my pop-up, it was called the beauty pop. And um, it was, yes, I was selling my things, but then it was a community where we had people that did henna. We had someone that came and did massages, someone that did manicures and pedicures. And then we taught like fitness classes. So it was more of a sisterhood on how to care for yourself. Um, and that was the most successful event that I've ever done. So I've done it twice and it was more of a sisterhood. It was more of like, you're with your girlfriends and you're getting together. And yes, we have vendors there and people shop, but it was more of a relaxed time. There was, you know, food was there and we had mocktails. So everyone like that was my most successful only because it meant the most to me. I didn't make that much money. But I feel like it brought my community together. So my Instagram family, whoever was in the New York, New Jersey area, it um um it brought all of us, you know, together. So that was the most successful. I feel whenever I speak to someone that's a customer and they tell me, hey, I wore your dress and I never felt more beautiful than I have than when I wore, you know, your clothing. And that's something that keeps me going because I know that if I stop, then where would people like me shop? Where would I shop? Like I wear my things every single day. Like where would I get my clothing from? You know, so it is a little selfish, but you know, then I do have the women, you know, it was one sister, she made um Hajj. So that's when you go to Mecca and you go to the Kaaba and you pray, right? So 
And that's the most holiest place for us as Muslims. So she took a picture wearing my dress in front of the Kaaba, you know, and she's like, Zubaydah, I wouldn't been able to fit anything else from anyone else <clears throat> had I not purchased from you. And to me, that meant a lot for me because not only am I selling clothes, but I'm helping women <laughs> in my own way by providing them something that Maybe they were too insecure. Maybe, you know, maybe they couldn't get from someone else. So those are the two most proudest things is really helping, you know, helping the women. Wow, that's amazing how you define success as just like, you know, being able to, it, it's all about other people. Yeah. And how about some of the struggles with the business? Okay. So with the struggles, um, <clears throat> one of my main struggles is, um, I would say lack of um, assistance with things because it's me and three other people, but they have much smaller roles. For me, I do everything. You know, when I do the pop-ups, my husband, he drives, you know. Um, right now, my oldest son, he helps like set up, but he's only 16. So I started 10 years ago. He was only six years old. So it's been a struggle like that with the pop-ups. That's why I kind of like, you know, push back a little bit with that. It's highly um, operational. I've worked with yeah, pop-ups before. Too. Yeah. Oh my gosh. There are a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't get to sit down. It's like constant, constant, you know? So um, that's one of the struggles is that, you know, I'm kind of still like a one man show and, you know, I have employees that help, you know, post social media, but it's not the same as, you know, creating the content, um, staying up with China, creating the products, you know, um, picking everything, designing the website. Like I do all of that. Wow. And um, and then I finance all of that from my own pocket. You know, and my husband, he works, um, you know, he works for Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas and um, he does IT. So between him and I, like we finance the business. So, you know, I've never wanted to take out a loan and, you know, because our sales are not astronomical, I don't usually qualify for like grants. So I feel like, you know, with small owned black businesses, it's a little difficult to get financing um, for our businesses. That way we can hire the employees. You know, we can, I can take a trip to China. I can say, okay, you know, I, I can be there in the manufacturing stages. You know, I can afford, um, you know, even though I do, you know, pay influencers, they're smaller influencers, you know, I will be able to have a budget for all of those things so that we can grow, you know, to a number that I feel like, um, is necessary, but because I've been around for 10 years, you would think, Hey, her brand's been here for 10 years. She should be at the level of, let's say a veiled collection, you know, which is a, you know, a different, you know, um, brand that is a, is not a black owned brand. Yes. And I feel like when you have brands like that, you know, that are not black or not Brown, you know, <laughs> they, people tend to, um, navigate or gravitate towards them because and then that's another struggle because they're a little bit more aesthetically pleasing than uh fat black girl i'm gonna just say it you know it's just like uh you know i'll rather <laughs> gravitate that way because they're more um um socially acceptable yeah, it's a, but we're seeing a lot of transition in the market, a little transition, I'll say. Yeah. We're seeing yeah. that movement and you are, you know, at, yeah. at the forefront of it. Yes. Um, definitely uh, starting to uh, diversify. Yes. Um, marketing in the fashion industry and even within the modest fashion. Industry. Yes, 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 definitely. Definitely. Where it's a fight, it's a fight, and it's a fight that I'm not willing to give up. Um, because I know my brand is it, it's not just a brand to sell clothing, right? I'm helping women with their identities, you know, with something that they're struggling with, which is why we have the community that we have. We have our live talks, you know, um, and we have our body positivity campaign. So to me, it's more like, like I said, what makes me proudest is 
you know, being able to help the women, being able to build a community with them, even if they don't purchase anything. You know, I would like to make sales, of course, but even if they don't purchase anything, it's really, you know, it's more about the person behind the dress. About your brand and your products, um, what types of feedback do you get? Positive, negative? It could be folks inside or outside the modest fashion community. Yeah, so... I get positive feedback, but you know, sometimes I do get constructive criticism. Some people um, that cannot fit the clothing, they are like, why don't you make this in a smaller size? If you made this in a smaller size, you would make more money. That's the number one <laughs> feedback that I get from women that can't fit the things because they love the quality. They love the prints. They love that, you know, is ethically made. They really do, you know, love the things from my brand, but then they also like that all of my things are unique. Um, cause a lot of other brands, like I said, they sell similar things. So they're like, wait, this is different. I'm nursing. I like the pocket. So they're like, if you sold a size small, you would make more money. And, and I always say back to them, well, we don't have a place that's just for curvy size women. We don't have a brand that's just for plus size. They have a brand that's just for regular size. Many brands. Yes, right? And so I want my brand to be unique, you know, and there's always an argument. Well, if you add it smaller, then you can make more money. And then, and I'm like, no, I'm going to stay with my customer. You know, I'm going to stay with the women that I serve because I'm that woman. And I understand, you know, that struggle. And sometimes, you know, you have to be exclusive with things and you're not in a the club. Then you're not in the club. Like yeah, the exclusive, exclusivity creates demand. It's a, yes. it's a cycle and it's also your positioning. Yes, yes, yes. But that is the number one um, <laughs> criticism that I get. But from my customers that truly, you know, love the brand, they love that it's exclusive. You know, they love that they can come to us and say, hey, you know, um, I need something that fits me, you know. And a lot of um, the struggles that I have with the customers is that they don't think they can fit the product. They're like, I'm too big. Well, I can't fit this, you know. And then when they do try it on, they're like, wow, you know. It was one sister, it was the day before the Eid, which is our holiday. She came into the store and she was like, oh, I went to every store in the tri-state area and nothing could fit me. And the sister told me to try, but I don't think even you have something that can fit me. So she came in and she tried on a dress and a whole face lit up and she ended up buying it in every color. And, you know... That to me, like it was the day before our holiday and I was stressed out, you know, and I like, you know, I have four kids, so I like to wrap gifts for them and everything. And I was like, oh, these people have me in here all day, you know, and she was the last customer. And when she said that, it just, it just softened my heart, you know, and I felt like this is why I do it. Because I've been that person that the day before our holiday, I'm running from store to store to store to find something and I can't find something. Then I have to wear something black or old or, you know, something that doesn't make me feel like the colorful person that I am, you know. Fantastic. You know, it really speaks to you. Thanks. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I know we touched a little bit about advertising. Um, I want to go into um, public imagery. So can you tell me how you market and promote your brands and products? You can talk a little bit maybe more about the website, um, the types of imagery or photo shoot styles that you use and sure. the types of people you feature and why. Sure, sure. Um, um, so as far as advertising through the website, Right now, we use um, two different photographers. So when I'm thinking of the concept for the shoot, if I know we have a holiday coming up, or if I know like, okay, this is our spring line, I try to, I started out with the design starting element first where the fabrics that I'm picking, the colors, okay, then, then when we get to the scheme for the photo shoot, if I choose a studio with background and, you know, I want it to all pull in. Um, I really try to hone in on models because I feel um, 
as a curvy size brand, it is extremely important to not only sell curvy size clothes, plus size clothes, but to show models as well that are that body type. Um, one mistake that I did make early on was I had a, a few smaller models um, in my marketing where, of course, I started at a size 10, which is, I would say, a medium. I do have girls in that range, but I feel like I had more girls in that range and not more towards the larger spectrum of my sizing, where then the customer was a bit confused, right? Right. Um, so now I scaled back with using so many smaller models where I'm using more on the larger side, right? Because me, if I'm going to buy a bra, like bras are very important, right? To women, right? In our life. If I see someone in the A cup, but they say, hey, we sell an E cup. I'm like, I don't know about this. You know, I like to see... <laughs> In advertising, so Lizzo, her brand, she has a new um, shapewear brand. She shows big girls versus um, um, Skims, right? She shows smaller girls that really don't need to wear those things. So how can you sell that to me, right? Even though I've never tried either one, right? I would buy from Lizzo's brand because I'm like, she's showing the big girls, put it on. If they can fit, if it can hold all of their roles together, then it can hold mine, right? So I feel like it's very important with the visual to speak to the customer that you're selling to by showing them themselves. Um, so that's extremely important to me. Um, that's one of the things in the beginning. And I have to admit, that's what I did. I said, okay, she's she can fit the clothes. She looks like a model. Let's use her because she's cute. But, you know, people want authenticity. Um, they want to see their reality in their face. Even though it's ugly, that's the reality. That's, you know, what it is. If I have to show rolls and jiggles, then, you know, that's what I have to show because that's that's my customer's reality. Yeah. Absolutely. It makes your um, business very unique. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, I know we talked about business and funding. You primarily um, uh, funded your business through personal funds. Did you seek investors or crowdsource at all? No, I think in the beginning, beginning stages, like family, they gave um, maybe like a thousand dollars each. And I was like, okay, I'll pay you back. And we did have a contract. Two family members gave a thousand each. So that was $2,000. But other than that, that was really it. Um, we've never crowdsourced. Um, I was thinking of doing um, a program with Macy's. So they have this program where you do a training with them and then um, they'll select a few people to sell in their stores or online. Um, so I know Abaya Attic, they were in Macy's and then Urban Modesty. They're another modest brand out of New York. So they did that and then they had to do crowdfunding um, in order to um, raise the capital that Macy's was asking for. Um, so yeah, Abaya Attic in Urban Modesty. Modesty. And I believe yeah. the Verona collection also, but they don't, yeah. Yes, Verona, yeah, Verona and Macy's because it was, was it a, yeah, Abaya Attic did it. Hmm. They did it after Verona because Verona was first. Yeah. Verona was first. And then everyone started, you know, kind of seeing, okay, so how did they get into that? So, yeah, when I read the requirements, you know, they wanted to see your books for a certain amount of time, but then they wanted maybe like 250, 250,000, you know, and I... I don't know if Macy's is manufacturing on your behalf or what the case may be, but I do know from Urban Modesty, um, the sister that owns it, her and I started at the same time. You know, she said, um, you're shipping out on your own. It's just through their website. So you would have to send it, but you would have to have enough product, you know, um, so that Macy's has product on the website. And then I felt like it was a win-win for Macy's, right? Because, you know, Macy's is then 
diversifying their catalog of clothing by adding in Muslim brands or, you know, small brands. Um, but there's no risk for them because you have to produce everything and they just add it. It's just adding a product to their website, but the businesses, they have to create, they have to come up with the money to have a thousand of each pieces just in case Macy's sell it. And even though it's Macy's, they could be making as many sales as I'm making, you know? So um, it to me, it was a win-win for Macy's. Yes, it looks good to say, hey, I'm in Macy's, but you're then left with all of these dresses through Macy's website if they're not selling it. But then you also have to sell through your website. So I was, you know, looking to maybe try to do that. But then, you know, I felt like the capital part that I would have to raise it it really it it didn't make any sense for me. So yeah, other than that, <laughs> um, no, we're you know out of my own pocket wow. and um my husband's pocket and yeah. I did read recently that um following the pandemic, um wholesalers are becoming a little bit more flexible with their mm-hmm. terms. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if there are other options on the table where they were, I know in the past, very inflexible. That's why so yeah. many small designers left. Yes. Oh. In the last couple okay. of years. So yeah. That's yeah. changed recently. Okay. It yeah. Might be worth a <laughs> check. Yeah. A try. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause I do know during the pandemic, a lot of the, um, the companies, the manufacturing companies overseas, even with like um bigger brands, they were putting in orders to have their things made and they wouldn't pay the um companies overseas because everything was shut down. Mm-hmm. So a lot of companies panicked and they were like, well, we can't afford to pay the rest of this invoice. We're just going to leave them hanging, you know? So now a lot of wholesalers, they... The, some places their minimum order quantity used to be like 50. Now it's like 250. Now they want to secure that money up front. And it makes it difficult for smaller businesses like myself, you know, because my quantity, how much I have to order is now larger than I'm sitting with product. During our busy season, which is, you know, Ramadan and our eats, you know, I do make a lot of that money but then times like now when it's the winter time and women are not really going anywhere we're trying to wear our sweatpants we're trying to be cozy and comfy you know my sales do drop a bit you touched also a little bit on sustainability ethics in the community um how did or do you incorporate and consider sustainability and an ethical business model into your company okay so what we don't, what I hate to like do here is fast fashion, right? You'll have brands that every two weeks they have something new. Now that's not sustainable. You know, it's like, okay, here's a new thing. Here's a new thing. Come up with a new thing. And my team often, you know, tells me, well, this brand has a new hijab this week. Every Tuesday, hot hijab, they, um, launch a new hijab. Every Tuesday is new hijab, new hijab. So I'm like, well, what are they doing with these 52 new hijabs every year? Because it's 52 weeks in a year. So every week is a new hijab. And she's ordering thousands, millions of these hijabs. To me, that's not sustainable. If I don't need a thousand hijabs, I would like a thousand. (laughs) I don't need, you know, a thousand. So as far as my dresses, we have we come out with um, six new dresses um, twice a year. Sometimes we may come out once a year because I feel like the more clothing that we have, the more trash that we're making, right? The more people are giving it away. Nowadays, if you go into Goodwill, like it's stuffed with things from people, you know, that are fortunate to purchase something new every time they walk into the store. Every time you go into the store, You shouldn't need to keep buying, you know, things. So that's one thing that I truly keep in mind is that, you know, we cut down on our collections. And if we do multiple collections through the year, there are a few pieces. They're not 12 pieces twice a year. It's six and six, or, you know, it's a smaller collection mid-year. That's really how we try to keep down on that. And what type of community outreach or like such as CSR activities 
um, uh, are you involved in? Yeah. So there's one um, um, nonprofit organization that we donate a lot of our clothing to. It's called um, El Nisa, um, which is a nonprofit organization. The sister, she gives hijabs and dresses to women that are um, previously incarcerated. So you'll have Muslim women that are in prison. She sends hijabs to them in prison. And then when they come out, she helps them with um, recruiting for jobs, looking for jobs. And then she provides them with clothing. So Style by Zubeda, we every year we donate a lot of the things to her. If we have anything, you know, that a customer may have returned, we donate to her. Um, a lot of our products, you know, if something is out of season, we'll donate to her. Um, and we also help with job recruiting as well. We've had a few people that, you know, were previously incarcerated. And once they, you know, were released and were looking for jobs, if we had anything at our store that, you know, if we needed someone to clean or to restock, we hired a few of the sisters. So that's one of the main you know, um, organizations that we donate, not just our product, but our time to, and helping, you know, reacclimate the women to society. Um, then I have a few other smaller business that, um, I mentor them a few other clothing business. So, you know, I mentor them with social media, um, with their branding, with their pricing. And I do this for free. Like I know people, you know, that, you know, they charge to be a mentor. So yeah, two smaller brands. Um, one is a modest, um, clothing brand. And then one, she sells like sweatshirts and, um, hoodies and stuff like that. So I, you know, I help those two sisters as well. Wow. All right. And, um, that's really amazing. Thank you. Really, you are really part of the community. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> you're, and you're building it. Yes, yes. I'm helping build the community Um, because I'm from the community, you know, and yeah, we're kind of like all we have, you know, especially with, you know, Black owned businesses in Black communities, you know, we have to kind of help each other build each other up. 